Welcome, everyone. My name is George Dimakopoulos. I'm the co-director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center and Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies. It is my great pleasure to serve as the Master of Ceremonies this evening. Um, and we will begin, uh, as we always do, uh, with prayer. And for the opening invocation, I'd like to call Father um, Michael Mick McCarthy um, uh, of the Society of Jesus to the podium. Father Mick. Good evening and welcome everybody, and, and particularly on, on behalf of our president, Father Joseph McShane, who is not able to be with us tonight because he is having a tooth pulled. So re <laughs> keep him in your hearts and minds. But tonight, for this evening's invocation, I, I would like to quote from uh, an evening hymn of Gregory of Nazianzus. We bless you now at twilight, my Christ, God's word, God's brightness, from light that knows no dawning. And steward of the spirit, your threefold radiance woven into one strand of glory. You have abolished darkness, forming on light's foundation a world that light embraces, shaping unstable matter into a stable order, this beauty that delights us. Our human mind you lighten with reason and with wisdom, forming in us an image of heaven's transcendent brilliance, that we in light may see light and be ourselves its beacon. The sky you have illumined with lamps of varied brightness, commanding night and daylight gladly to yield their station and honor by example the laws of kin and friendship. By one you ease the labors of flesh with all its burdens, you wake us by the other to do the work that pleases you, that we might flee the darkness and come at last to daylight, that day no night can conquer. Let mind then, now free, address you, God, in freedom, Father and Son and Spirit, holy and undivided, to whom be praise and honor from age to age unending. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. As is also our custom, um, we have again this year asked a friend of the Orthodox Christian Study Center to offer the introduction for our speaker. So uh, giving the introduction to our speaker this evening is Mr. John Sidolides, Principal at Trilogy Advisors. Your Eminence, Dr. Stephen Friedman, distinguished guests. Um, I was humbled when I had received the phone call earlier this year from George and from Telly, inviting me to introduce this evening Dr. David Bentley Hart. Dr. Hart is an exceptional Eastern Orthodox scholar of religion. He is a philosopher, a writer, and cultural commentator nearly peerless in America. I've never met him before this evening, and uh, I had first read his compelling essays many years ago in magazines such as Touchstone and The New Atlantis, and especially in First Things, which is self-described as, quote, America's most influential journal of religion and public life. Now that is a subjective description to be sure, <laughs> but most of us would not argue with the central premise of the editors. Our first things is richly deserving of the esteem in which it is held. But in our capitalist society, and here I risk provoking our keynote speaker, competition is a very good thing. So there may be about two million Orthodox Christians across the United States out of about 200 to 250 million Orthodox Christians worldwide the third largest Christian community in the world after Roman Catholics and Pentecostals and Charismatics together, we'll say. Yet one sometimes is frustrated by the relatively little amount that we hear from the Orthodox Christian world in the realm of public discourse in America. 
There are major summits of the ecumenical patriarch and the pope to advance the goals of ecclesiastical reconciliation and communion. Patriarch Bartholomew has convened the Holy and Great Council last year and will further proclaim global environmental stewardship admonitions for all to know and respect. His Eminence, Archbishop Demetrius, here with us this evening, declares with clarity and with fervor the enlightened wisdom and power of the Orthodox faith. And on the global scale, Moscow's apparent weaponization of the Russian Orthodox Church to achieve geopolitical aims in Europe and in the Middle East has placed a somewhat unwelcome lens on the ancient faith of Jesus Christ and the Apostles. But few Americans know how the Orthodox Christian mind understands the world in which we live and the life that is to come, and not many more know much about Orthodox Christianity at all. That, the good news, is about to change. Now five years old, the Orthodox Christian Study Center is firmly integrated into the scholarly sinews of this distinguished institution of Fordham University. And next year, we eagerly anticipate far richer and more voluble contributions to modern American society and to broader Western and global exchanges of theology and philosophy and the centrality of transcendent ideas when this center launches the Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies. Now, this will be a peer-reviewed journal publishing leading scholarship on all aspects of the thought, the history, society, politics, theology, and culture of Orthodox Christianity broadly conceived. And tonight's lecture is a major step forward in that greater direction of Orthodox engagement of our modern culture and society. Dr. Hart is a convert to Orthodox Christianity, one of the most prolific modern Orthodox authors and among the foremost academic and philosophical apologists for orthodoxy within America's lay community. He will speak tonight on, quote unquote, America's orthodoxies, an increasingly vital subject given the power that converts to the faith are bringing to orthodox parishes nationwide. Many cradle orthodox faithful, and I'm privileged to be in this group, we cherish our sublime rituals and our holy feast days. But do we know well the narrative of the Bible or even the meaning of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do we truly recognize and worship him as fully divine and fully human, as the God-man, as our faith teaches us? And what example do we as parents and as lay leaders of the Orthodox Church set in our own daily lives. 60% of our children, even when raised in the church, will abandon their Christian faith by the time they're 25 years old. This is modern American culture. As Americans increasingly take the Christian church for granted, Christianity is in fact blossoming in otherwise distant parts of the world, especially in Africa and surprisingly in China, which may have as many as 200 million Christians, according to current demographic trends, by 2030, making it the first or second largest Christian nation in the world, China. Imagine how the world is changing so rapidly. So how do we, America's Orthodox, begin to strengthen our own religious education our scriptural devotion, our theological underpinnings, and strategic evangelization to build a greater and more enduring Orthodox Church in the United States for the generations to follow. Well, our salvation may derive from our newest parishioners. Many of the converts to Orthodoxy bring an evangelical or charismatic passion from their earlier religious experiences and their contributions are repowering a religious community that must confront serious demographic challenges in America today and in the years ahead. And few intellectuals are better positioned to help us explore the answers to these troubling questions than Dr. David Bentley Hart. 
He is a research fellow at the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study. His specialties are, get ready for this, philosophical theology, systematics, patristics, classical and continental philosophy, and Asian religion. Most of us specialize in one or two things. Among his many books are Atheist Delusions of 2009, The Experience of God of 2013, and a popular, and for the simpler minded like myself, history of uh, Christianity, which I thoroughly recommend to all of you as a wonderful coffee table book, as Dr. Hart will describe, but a wonderful primer on the history of the Christian faith and its impact throughout the world. And Dr. Hart is also the author of a new and quote unquote, pitilessly literal translation of the New Testament, which will be available in just several weeks in late October to enlighten us on the subject of America's orthodoxies. It is indeed a pleasure to introduce to all of you the great, one of the great intellectuals, theologians, and cultural commentators in America in 2017, Dr. David Bentley Hart. Um, I can't possibly live up to that, so um, I think there's a bar across the street. Uh, thank you so much. That's very uh, generous, to say the least, and uh, I'm honored to be here, needless to say. Thank you to everyone uh, associated with this conference and the Greater Fordham uh, theological community in bringing me here. I was delighted to be invited. and. I am delighted to be here, and, uh, and I hope that uh, you will forgive me if, if, having said all that, I now uh, proceed to be somewhat vague and elliptical and vaguely diffuse, uh, because I have many questions uh, but few answers, and many intuitions but, but no certitudes, and many apprehensions and hopes but very little by way of foresight. So I'm going to beg your indulgence uh, in advance uh, and begin um, with a story. Now, uh, as a rule, it's bad form to borrow someone else's personal anecdote. But sometimes a story is too perfectly apt not to repeat. So the best I can do by way of decorum here is to acknowledge that this is something that happened not to me, but to my eldest brother, uh, Addison some years ago. That really is his name. I, I can't help it. Uh, Addison, some years ago. He was in Constantinople at the time, or, uh, or Istanbul, if you're going to be pedantic, um, on a tour bus, which is not a place you would normally find him. And among his fellow travelers, there was a very charming recent American convert to Greek Orthodoxy, a middle-aged gentleman from some sultry quarter of the Deep South, who, to judge just by his attire, and his Scots-Irish physiognomy could have been mistaken for your typical genial, cordial, open-hearted, white, naugahyde-encrusted uh, arthropod uh, scuttling along towards a meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, now, this provided us enough cognitive dissonance to, to wrap the day in an atmosphere of the surreal for my brother because, you know, it, 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 we're, it, we were just, he, like me, becoming more and more used to discovering evangelical uh, culture, embracing orthodoxy. But a moment of uh, something like absurdity arrived when this fellow lugubriously remarked, unbidden, in a rich drawl soaked in tobacco and sarsaparilla, these Latins simply cannot understand what the sack of Constantinople in 1204 still means to us. <laughs> Now, uh, my brother, uh, of course, it's funnier when George Dimakopoulos isn't in the room, I guess, but now my brother's appetite for the ludicrous is every bit as insatiable as my own, but this was just a little more than he could absorb with perfect equanimity, and so being mischievous in as earnest a tone as he could affect, he said, well, maybe the Byzantines had it coming because of the 1182 massacre of Metic Latins in the city and the sale of their children and wives to Turkish slavers. Now, needless to say, this, the, the morose southern gentleman didn't know what he was talking about. But um, 
that's not, uh, I mean, he probably had never heard of the sack of Constantinople either until a few months earlier. And so there was something rather impressive in his ability to convert the latter into a shattering personal trauma, throbbing like an open wound in his soul, the thought of which left him as inconsolably melancholy as the memory of the burning of Atlanta or the fall of Richmond. <laughs> I actually love people like this, you know, I'm from the South myself. Uh, well, Maryland, the Upper South, it's, it's a debate. But somehow this kind of abrupt but total adoption of another cultural identity, even if it's little more than, at times, a, a sort of fantastic version of that identity, is something of which Americans are, I think, sometimes uniquely capable. Uh, perhaps this is because to be American is to be the deracinated child of some other land or people, or several other lands and peoples. Our own national identities is quite often a sort of bright, garish, fabulous surface that we've spread thinly over forgotten depths. Our national narrative is essentially an idea, never fully realized, of course, but able to keep us borne aloft above an abyss of immense historical oblivion. Now, to be truly American in, in, in the most extreme way, I suppose, would be to be a kind of Proteus, capable of becoming just about anything. And that actually may have, uh, amount to a kind of cultural genius. Uh, I, I'm not criticizing it. But it does raise questions regarding what becomes of a tradition like Eastern Orthodoxy, or I should say the many Eastern Christian Orthodox traditions that constitute uh, the Eastern Christian presence in this country when it's immersed in an element of ceaseless dissolution and transformation of the sort that American life has always been. I mean, what does the fact of the gentleman that my brother met in uh, Istanbul, what does, that, what does that fact portend? As much as he had succeeded in transforming himself into a Byzantine tormented by the historical memories of all his Byzantine forebears, he had also succeeded in transforming the Byzantium of his imagination into something conformable to his own cultural sensibility and native capacity for immemorial regrets, resentments, desolating memories. Every act of conversion involves a reciprocal transformation, a mutual act of appropriation. Inevitably then, orthodoxy in America must in some sense become ever more America's special variant of the faith. And so what might that look like? It might seem a trivial question at first from our, from our daily experience. I mean, orthodoxy, after all, has been here for quite some time. And unlike its presence in native lands, exists simultaneously in all its cultural expressions, uh, despite which it has proved a remarkably intransigent property, retaining not only much of its aboriginal culture, but scarcely ever venturing across the lines of its own differing national jurisdictions. In that sense, the story of orthodoxy in America has, for the most part, been another version of the great American immigrant myths. Peoples displaced from their ancient homelands by desperate need or buoyant hope, or both, beginning here anew while retaining a firm sense of their own cultures and ways and tongues, persisting, prospering, remaining distinctive while still finding their place in the larger society. In each generation, some have married out of the faith while others have married in, but the communities have until fairly recently remained fairly stable redoubts of ethnic and religious identity. In that sense, orthodoxy in America has been a success, at least in American terms. Though perhaps for just that reason, not always necessarily in spiritual terms. After all, as significant as diverse Orthodox congregations have always been for the preservation of ethnic communities, this diversity of jurisdictions has also contributed to preserving the original sin of Orthodox culture. It's all too frequent. Failure to detach the universal mission of the church from the local allegiances and worldly concerns of nations and ethnic groups. In a sense, though, the Orthodox have come to America in the millions. Orthodoxy itself might never properly arrive here in its own right until the faith has shed, however painfully, the burden of preserving ethnic pride and identity. Not abandoning the past, but not hanging on to it 
too fiercely, and has finally, ideally, achieved a single jurisdictional presence here, but that's, that's many decades in the future, so I can defer the issue for now. To be honest, my interest is not in the ways that Orthodox communities have adapted themselves to the immigrant experience or the American way of life. I'm much more deeply concerned about the ways in which America may refashion, reinvent, so to speak, orthodoxy in its own image alongside or within these transplanted communities and then export the product abroad. And I'm also concerned with the question of whether that synthesis, should it come about, would represent a new epoch in orthodoxy, a genuinely American expression of the faith ready to take its place alongside its more ancient expressions, or, it other, or in other ways might it pose a profound challenge to the integrity of the tradition. And I think there are both promises and perils here. This is, after all, the chief danger America poses to all cultures alongside the promises it makes. It's not merely a place, but also an ideology. It's not just a physical landscape, much less an ensemble of shared memories and legends. It's a nation more constructed than cultivated, built around a political and social project, always somewhat in flux, but also more or less relentlessly oriented toward a future generated out of its own native ideals and values, rather than out of any traditions it might have inherited from the past lines its peoples left behind in coming here. Moreover, it intends the future not only for itself, but also in, in a distant, dim, inevitable sense for peoples everywhere. This is the great experiment of a democratic republic. And in that sense, America's is not only an ideology, but something at times for some approaching a religion with its own sacred writ, its founding fathers, its radiant eschatological visions its hymns and prayers and benedictions. And it has its special national values, many of which, uh, some of which actually, being essentially libertarian in form in, in the American sense of libertarian, are at times rather hard to reconcile with aspects of the gospel that seem fairly foundation, foundational. But it's a stupendous and be beguiling reality as well, enormous and seductively grand and gloriously improbable. And so when we try to think clearly about the destiny of the Eastern Church on these shores, we need perhaps first to ask whether orthodoxy in America can indefinitely continue to resist incorporation into the native orthodoxies of America, and yet still be nourished by what America has to offer. To a very substantial degree, the future will be determined by how well Eastern Orthodox communities continue to adjust to the singular situation in America with regard to conversions from other communions, but most especially, as my predecessor mentioned, from various forms of evangelical Protestantism. Conversions occur everywhere, of course, but usually in the form of individuals seeking a confessional refuge to whose native forms they are willing to assimilate, it may be overly willing. In America since the 1970s, by contrast, the rate of conversion has increased to the point that, while the absolute number of converts may not be immense, the number relative to the Orthodox population is anything but negligible. And I'm speaking as a convert, uh, not, not from an evangelical background, admittedly, but, but nonetheless, as for, 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 I'm an American, uh, sometimes. Uh, of course, some people have disputed that. Uh, more to the point, the community of converts in America is often sufficiently distinctive and sufficiently socially cohesive to constitute a kind of resident cultural presence within the larger Orthodox community. I mean, if you take the, the, the very special case of the Evangelical Orthodox Mission, in which we saw an entire ecclesial community already, you know, with Orthodox forms in place, being admitted and yet not dissolved into the church, a community with its own special histories, longings, internal alliances, as it turns out also internal antagonisms, idiosyncrasies, and perhaps, alas, some prejudices left largely intact. Now true, in ages past, entire tribes and nations were converted from paganism to Byzantine Christianity. You know, large mass conversions are not an anomaly. But the situation in America today is not analogous to that. 
Rather, orthodoxy has become a haven for a large, if loosely affiliated, community of Christians whose expectations of their faiths have been formed as much by the traditions they've left behind as the orthodoxy they have embraced, because quite reasonably they see themselves not as pagan converts, but as Christians moving more deeply into, into Christian tradition. At times, this has had something of a refreshing and invigorating effect on local orthodox parishes. Uh, and the greater community. It's also at other times, however, uh, uh, exercised a remarkably narrowing effect upon orthodoxy as a presence within American society too. And this is because many of the converts, and again, unfairly, I, I might say, especially, especially converts from evangelicalism, but this isn't meant as an opprobrium. I just think this is an issue of different uh, traditions, different temperaments. Many of these converts do come from traditions that being rather historically shallow manif uh, manifestations of a fairly modern form of piety don't have much of a concept of licit theological latitude or theological complexity. Many are accustomed to think of Christian faith as simply a uniform set of explicit beliefs, almost a catalog of propositions and susceptible to few interpretations. Um, I, uh, a friend of mine, a young fellow who was a convert from the, uh, an evangelical background, uh, recently published what he called the Orthodox Faith Statement. And I thought, he thought it might do well in churches. It was sort of the Nicene Creed and then some propositions. And it, was, it was oddly like going to a church with its own, fa you know, an evangelical church with its own faith statement. But for him, that seemed a natural way of promoting an understanding of orthodoxy, that rather than an immersion, for, say, in the experience of the liturgy. <coughs> and merely by an accident of history, for instance, most American converts have adopted a version of orthodox self-understanding that became dominant in the latter half of the 20th century, with good reason. I, I mean just the, the Neopolemite synthesis, uh, as promoted by that remarkable generation or those generations of Russian scholars whose writings opened the world of Eastern Christian thought to Western Christians, like Lossky and Meindorf and Schwemann of blessed memory. Now, I admit that this particular approach to orthodoxy is one that I, I don't think is completely adequate. I mean, I, I don't take its reading of the uh, patristic tradition always to be rich and various enough, and I'm not even sure it gets Palamas entirely correct, but that's of small importance because I say, let a thousand flowers blossom. I may be wrong after all, Unlikely, but <laughs> it's happened at least twice. Once I didn't know the time had changed. And, you know. <laughs> what I think disaster, what could be disastrous, however, is if this becomes an inability of certain American Orthodox converts to distinguish between that particular synthe rather synthetic school of Orthodoxy and Orthodox faith as such. Because then nothing else in the rich tradition of Eastern Christian thought and devotion, say the Byzantine scholastics, the Russian religious philosophers of the 19th century, and so on, let alone any movement within modern Orthodox theology that doesn't conform to that system, uh, is, is granted the right to be considered Orthodox Christianity. And this has led in uh, recent years, with the internet becoming now the place where apparently theology is done, to some <laughs> fairly ferocious uh, debates among people, uh, as far as I can tell, live in their mother's basements, but that's if you know. <laughs> It's these good souls, more than any other faction within the church, who do tend to be the most obstreperous and rigorous and self-confident guardians of what they regard as pure orthodox. And so at times actually attacking sort of native orthodox traditions they don't recognize or orthodox scholarship and theological speculation that doesn't correspond to the abstracted, somewhat attenuated view of the tradition they were taught in its propositional form. In place of the biblicist fundamentalism they left behind, some tend towards a kind of neo-patristic fundamentalism. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to be overly harsh, and I am making wild generalizations here, and every community has its share of purists and fundamentalists, uh, in, the, in the main they do little harm. But in the case of the Orthodox Church in this country, there is a peril that ought not to be overlooked just because we might not be prepared for it. 
It's in the nature of conversion that it involves not only a sincere affection from what one is converted to, but sometimes an earnest and even sometimes resentful disaffection for what one has converted from. And this can bear a bitter fruit. In the case of some former evangelicals I've known moreover, conversion to orthodoxy has often seemed an especially agreeable retreat to ancient Christianity precisely because they can do it without being forced to surrender something nearly as precious to themselves as their faith itself, which is a hostility towards Roman Catholicism. And this, is a, this is, has been a disastrous development, to be honest. As a rule, Orthodox tradition has more than enough endemic suspicion of Western Christianity. And of course, there are large and significant differences, doctrinal, theolo theological, ecclesial, between Eastern and Western traditions. No reason to pretend there aren't, but precisely because there are real differences that divide Christians, it's absolutely imperative that we not allow ourselves to deepen those divisions by exaggerating, misrepresenting, or to put it bluntly, celebrating them. And to be perfectly frank, the emerging American form of orthodoxy in, on, in, its, in its threatening side that is, an orthodoxy shaped more by converts to than by inheritors of the church's tradition, in some ways shaped more by them, has proved very fertile ground for a number of, of very foolish fl fr uh, claims regarding the differences between East and West. Uh, and so, so strong have some of these claims been that they've had the extraordinary effect of distorting orthodox understandings not only of Western Christianity, but of orthodoxy itself by a kind of inversion of the logic of anti-Catholic apologetics, sometimes producing an almost parodic form of orthodox uh, uh, discourse. Now, I, I mean, not to dwell on things too recherche, but I mean, in recent years uh, has become something of a fashion among certain polemicists to claim that certain aspects of Catholic tradition are absolutely irreconcilable to orthodoxy. And they pick out things like the definition of God as actus poros, uh, talk about the analogia antis, talk about the divine simplicity in the strongest terms. They say they're not alien to orthodoxy, and yet, curiously enough, these are, of course, absolutely essential aspects of orth orthodox tradition that come straight from the Greek fathers. And you really have to twist and turn to make the Latin formulation sound obnoxious from an Eastern perspective. Uh, and Orthodox scholarship down the ages had no problem with them, from you know, John of Damascus, who's sort of the foundation of scholastic tradition, to Sergei Bulgakov, who, and if you disagree with me, I don't want to know, is the greatest systematic theologian of the 20th century. And so we find ourselves in a strange position in which orthodox scholars are claiming that certain essential essential elements of orthodox tradition are Latin perversions of the faith, and then because some of them come from the intellectual culture of the evangelical world, offering instead a kind of Anglo-American analytic theism that whatever its philosophical defects is certainly not orthodox tradition. But even that is not my principal interest. I sound like I'm just complaining. <laughs> so I'll go on complaining for that. Anyway, over time, theological issues clarify themselves or subtly mutate into different issues altogether. And on the whole, they have little effect on the daily lives of the faithful. Theologians aren't really nearly as important as they imagine themselves to be. And the church as a whole would probably be better off if they were all periodically exterminated, uh, say every 20 years or so. I raise the matter only as an illustrative, as illustrative of a larger set of concerns regarding the slower alchemy of cultural transformations. As I've noted, America has a singular power for refashioning things in its own image and to do so with an with an almost irresistible energy. It's part of the appeal and for part of the, much of the world, part of the, the terror that America represents. And as orthodoxy here continues to develop in relation to this country's indigenous ideals, and as its ties to distant lands continue to become more remote, and as its demographics become more diverse, there's every reason to, to suspect it will become increasingly a reflection 
of the native temperaments and tacit ideals of America's orthodoxies. And I don't mean simply that the orthodox in this country will continue as they have done for centuries to accommodate themselves to the social realities of the nation for both good and ill. Say, on the one hand, for good, America's admirable and wonderful ethnic diversity and pluralism and its potentially benignly corrosive effect on the church's sometimes destructive confusion between preaching the gospel and preserving ethnic identity. And that's one of the things I see in the energy of evangelical converts working towards in a good way. Um, but there's also uh, the bad side, uh, is, say America's, um, uh, shall I say, idolatrous adoration and sanctification of free markets, the, the really disgraceful dereliction of responsible, responsibility for social welfare that this does perpetuate uh, to the justifiable distaste of the rest of the developed world. And one really does have to live in an American bubble not to see how bad it is. I mean, rather that orthodoxy will continue to be shaped by an inevitably dialectical relation to America's distinctive spiritual ethos. And what this may produce may as yet be unimaginable. Orthodoxy is, is a tradition sunk deep in history with roots of memory and deep resistance to change. But in a sense, the great dream or romance of America is the prospect of a people without a history a humanity that has, as none before it ever did, escaped the prison of memory. Hence, though there's nothing like a distinctive American civilization, perhaps, there definitely is a distinctive American Christianity. It tends to be something fluid, scattered, fragmentary, fissile, either mildly or exorbitantly heretical. <laughs> but it can nevertheless justly be called the American religion, and it's a powerful creed. It's, for one thing, a style of faith lacking, um, admittedly, in beautiful material forms or coherent institutional structures, not by accident, but essentially. It's inexpressiveness in the civic form, I mean, of just beautiful civic sp uh, spaces, is a consequence not simply of cultural privation or frontier simplicity or of modern utilitarianism or some lingering Puritan reserve toward ecclesial rank, and architectural ostentation, but also a profound and radical resistance to outward forms. It is, in its purest form, which we've seen flare up at various times in the history of the country, as great awakenings, so to speak. It's a religion of the book, of private revelation, of oracular wisdom, even emotional rapture, sometimes wonderful emotional rapture. It's not one of tradition, hierarchy, or public creeds. Even where it creates intricate institutions of its own or, or creates large temples, it tends to do so on its own terms, in a void, in a cultural and ideally physical desert, at a fantastic remove from all traditional sources of authority or historical validity or sometimes even good taste. But, um, you know, well, I mean, Mormonism is an example. It just couldn't happen anywhere else. New religions begin. They don't begin like that except in America. <laughs> I mean, just overturn the entire universe and <laughs> start again from the beginning. But in one sense, this isn't at all surprising. America was born in a flight from the old world's thrones and altars, the corrupt accommodations between spiritual authority and spiritual power, the old, between, sorry, worldly power uh, and spiritual authority, and the confusion of reverence for God with servility before princes. As a political project in its own right, the United States was the first Western nation explicitly founded on principles requiring no official allegiance between religious confession and secular government. We tend to forget we're the first laicist nation. Even if this had not been so, the ever greater religious heterogeneity of America over the courses of, of, of its history would surely, sooner or later, have made such an alliance absurdly impractical, and so, in fact, America was established as the first truly modern nation, consciously the first to dissociate its constitutional order from the political mythologies of a long disintegrating Christendom, and the first predominantly Christian country to place itself under, at most, God's general providential supervision, but not under the command of any of his officially recognized lieutenants. 
The nation began, one could argue, from a place at which other nations had not yet reached. And yet, when one considers the results of this odd apocalyptic liberty from history, it's rather astonishing, because though it arose out of the end of Christendom, it somehow avoided the religious and cultural fate of the rest of the modern West. Far from blazing a trail into the post-Christian future, America went quite a different way, down paths no other Western society would ever tread or even know how to find. Whereas European society, at varying speed, but fairly uniformly, experienced the end of Christendom simultaneously as the decline of faith. As the church went, so went belief. In America, the opposite happened. And here, the paucity of institutional mediations between the transcendent and the imminent went hand in hand with a general, largely formless, and yet utterly irrepressible intensification of faith. Rather than an exhaustion of religious longing, it's revival. Rather than a long nocturnal descent into disenchantment, a new dawning of early Christianity's elated expectation of the kingdom. Now, admittedly, I'm being overly general again. Um, just about every living religion has found some kind of home here, bringing along whatever institutional supports it could fit into its luggage. Many such creeds have managed to preserve the better parts of their integrity, and I, I'm not doubting that. And this is certainly, again, true of the orthodoxy that arrived here in the successive waves of immigration. Still, I would argue, with a little temerity perhaps, such communities exist here as displaced fragments of other spiritual worlds, embassies for more homogeneous religious cultures. And it's from those cultures that they derive their cogency. They're beneficiaries of the hospitable and capacious indeterminacy of American spirituality, but not its direct expressions. The form of Christianity most truly indigenous to America is one simultaneously peculiarly disembodied and indomitably vigorous. And its unity is one of temperament rather than of confession. At its purest, in fact, it, is, it, it, it strives to be free of memory and so of anxiety. Uh, towards a state of almost perfect timelessness, you know, apart from human affairs where God and the soul can meet and speak and affirm one another. And uh, evangelicalism, for both good and ill, is the purest expression of this faith. It can lead to absolutely invincible faith. It can lead also to absolutely invincible intellectual narrowness. And both things have to be taken into account. Moreover, uh, I mean, Amer some forms of American evangelical culture were not lacking tradition so much as cordially adverse to it on principle. What is tradition, after all, but man-made history? And what is history other than an exile from paradise? What need does one have of tradition when one has the Bible, that eternal love letter from Jesus to the soul, inerrant, unambiguous, uncorrupted? by the vicissitudes of human affairs. I actually have a great admiration for this, strange to say at times, not always, as I say, it's a, it's a matter of taste. I mean, Joel Osteen would try the patience of, uh, of anyone, but I mean, in its, in its most natural, organic, and genuinely Christian expression, and with the great generosity of soul that accompanies it, and still, it, it, it assumes at times extreme emotive forms of total and unsullied reverie, uh, the pure present of a beautiful world in which in, ingenuous outcries and gestures bring forth instantly succor and substance. And, you know, at its most intensely fundamentalist, so precipitous is its flight from the gravity of history into that Edenic eschatological rapture that it reduces all of cosmic history to a few thousand years of terrestrial existence and the whole of the present to a collection of signs urgently pointing to the world's imminent ending. So why though do I think all this matters? Why do I dwell on these things? Well, Eastern Orthodoxy in this country is not going to exchange its basilicas for megachurches. It's not going to abandon the divine liturgy in favor of something like Joel Osteen's saccharine orgies of sentiment. 
Did I phrase that ineptly? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, that might have sounded right. But whatever, if, if you've ever seen them. Why, after all, should the prevalence of this native religious sensibility prove any greater challenge to orthodox self-understanding than it has for, say, Roman Catholicism? Well, I mean, for one thing, Roman Catholicism in this country actually does often exhibit a number of odd social and cultural features that do, in fact, somewhat reflect the individualism, institutional insouciance, and ideological peculiarities of the American religious consciousness. But more to the point, where Catholicism is strong, orthodoxy is weak. The Roman Church is an immense presence here, at least scaffolded by a, a largely centralized institutional structure. <laughs> I get arguments about that, but yeah. uh, especially from those who think the Jesuits are out to destroy the world. <laughs> But its real source of stability is Rome and the larger communion of a church that circles the globe and can do so by, by taking in a variety of rites, R-I-T-E-S, rites. Moreover, it has a remarkably vigorous and large intellectual tradition incarnated in its innumerable great universities and colleges here, which produce great, a number of, great number of scholars whose training in every sphere of theological, philosophical, and historical research is of the most exemplary quality and depth. This simply isn't true of the Orthodox Church, either here or abroad. And this is to be expected because though there are a great many fine Orthodox scholars out there, the lands, the histories of the lands where Orthodoxy resides have su simply suffered uh, too many, how can I put it, setbacks over the centuries to be able to maintain that kind of consistent, and certainly don't have that kind of presence here. And among the scattered jurisdictions that do exist here, the resources for resistance to novel adventitious cultural forces are few and somewhat feeble. Now this is not necessarily always a bad thing. For instance, orthodoxy in this country by very virtue of its institutional weakness perhaps enjoys a moment of historical liberty from the worst aspects of Eastern Christian history. That is, the church's frequent servile relations to states and nations. The same thing that happened to the Catholicism in this country is it discovered it was in some ways freer to be the church. In generations to come, perhaps an orthodoxy purged of those toxins might evolve into something new in this land if the hierarchies of our communions can find a way, especially, of forging an institutionally unified church here. Although I understand, I understand how great the, the you know, diff, how, just how difficult that task is. That said, even this will require a certain vigilance and spiritual intelligence regarding which aspects of American culture can nourish orthodoxy on these shores and which might instead transform it into another variant of the American religious myth, for both, again, with both its strengths and its weaknesses. Uh, what I have called the American religion here, whether fairly or not, is in fact the native form of spiritual life most likely to determine the shape that orthodoxy continues to assume in this country, the, uh, I mean, uh, the greatest force from outside, simply because the forms of Christianity it molds and animates are where the lion's share of conversions to orthodoxy have been coming from for decades now. And also because frequently it is these converts who are among the most dynamic and assured and vigorously proselytizing elements in many congregations, to their credit. And for what it's worth, and conceding from the out outset the difficulty of prognostication regarding large or local cultural developments, my belief is that we are indeed seeing something like a new or a novel form of orthodoxy taking shape in this country. The, excuse me in this country, <clears throat> slowly but inexorably, one that is at least as American as it is orthodox. I suspect, moreover, that none of the existing orthodox jur jurisdictions is likely to be quite prepared to recognize and respond to every dimension of this reality, or know how to temper or guide its dynamisms as the need will arise. We'll see. And such is the vigor of this new reality that it will inevitably begin to have an influence on orthodox self-understanding in other lands. America, after all, is a tireless and uncontainable engine of cultural transformation. This new American orthodoxy will not, I think, supplant the more settled and ethnically restive 
communities here, but it will grow alongside and within them and overshadow them as a force within the larger culture, perhaps. It will, I suspect, be an intellectually narrow expression of the faith if we're not careful, like the native forms of Christianity from which it borrows its energies. And again, I don't see that as an opprobrium. I mean, it's just a fact of evangelical history. It doesn't have 2,000 years of patristic and medieval and systematic theology to draw on. And it will prove, at times, somewhat too hospitable to reactionary, and I mean reactionary, not conservative, reactionary politics. And that, too, we've seen taking shape in recent decades. And I'm beyond, and I'll be honest, I am somewhat apprehensive about it, even as I am hopeful that the wellsprings of orthodox spiritual life and tradition will ultimately pre prove deep and inexhaustible, too much so to be overwhelmed just by the formless and titanic power of American spirituality in its most exuberantly uncontrollable forms. So, frustratingly, perhaps, I have to end in ambiguity, posing questions I can't really answer. But it seems to me, just to sum up, that there are two emerging possibilities within the Eastern Church here worth looking at, and much will be determined by whether we possess the strength to control the one and the courage to embrace the other. The former is the appearance of this distinctively American orthodoxy, which, as is so often the case within American religious movements, will be largely constituted by a, an imagined history in place of real history and a religious ideology in place of a living tradition. The latter, though, is the possible natural development here, as could happen nowhere else of a self-aware orthodoxy that has long last severed its mission to speak the gospel from its institutional and cultural subordination to nations and governments and discrete peoples. Perhaps a day will then arrive when not a single Scots-Irish convert from the Deep South feels in the least obliged to convince himself that he's a Greek. <laughs> For the Orthodox Church itself will remind him that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek nor Georgian but all are one. I, I, I met Georgia in the American sense. I just realized that in an Orthodox setting, that joke doesn't work. Neither Jew nor Greek nor, nor South Carolinian, but all are one. This is to say, it seems to me, if there is a desire to pursue this end and enough spiritual wisdom among us to persevere in the pursuit, that Orthodoxy in America may, by way of our anomalous national experience, discover a way of being not American as such, but truly universal in its vision and form, and thereby becoming ever more the church that it has always been called to be, the home of all humanity in the eternal body of Christ. If the Orthodox in America have a mission to perform that is special to them, a vocation to obey, a vision to seek, let it, pray God, be this one. Thank you. I can take a few questions. You might have guessed, but my voice is failing me a bit, uh, as it always does. But uh, if there are any questions, I can do my best. Um, so you mentioned uh, mostly American Christianity in terms of evangelicalism. Um, well, no, not American Christianity. The native, that which is most native to these shores, not, not the forms of Christianity. <laughs> that have come here, but that which developed here out of its own native dynamisms. Do you think that's complicated at all by non-evangelical Protestantism? How do you think that, do you think that there's a potential for conversion from non-evangelical? Oh, well, there are plenty of them. I, I don't know. What, what do you think high church Episcopalians are? I, I was raised to think I was a Catholic, but you know, you couldn't, you couldn't convert, could con convince the nuns at the Catholic school nearby. Um, of course, actually, our nuns were much more traditional. <laughs> Anglican nuns or <laughs> strict Benedictines. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, there are converts from those communities, but it's just, as it happens, uh, most of those communities are either in dissolution or those who, who are there uh, have enough structure and enough tradition to satisfy them. 
I mean, if you're raised a Lutheran, that is a tradition that's grounded in the larger uh, tradition of the church and that has powerful intellectual uh, traditions, systematic theologians of enormous gifts. Um, it has things that, that aren't there, and so there are far fewer people who feel moved. There is a dissatisfaction that you encounter in the, in the evangelical world. A lot of evangelicals have, within their own communities, become interested in the church fathers and all, sor all sorts of interesting developments. But there are those who are really looking for something that doesn't have the, 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 what they feel at times is the intellectual, cultural, spiritual thinness that, the, 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 that they're rebelling against. And so we, we, just, we just see lots of converts from the evangelical world. For every Lutheran convert, several hundred uh, from sort of free church evangelical traditions. I don't know if I could. Um, um, <laughs> the uh, founding fathers, as a rule, were, uh, despite uh, tendencies to try to revise the record in recent years, not not really that interested in in um, uh, specifically Christian tradition. But but they were, yeah, they did have a romantic and at times very serious. Uh, commitment to what was the 18th century understanding of of the Greeks uh, of the uh, of Greek democracy in its ancient forms and this became if nothing else an ideological prop um, I don't know if that has any relation one way or the other to how Greek Orthodox I mean you know the way it is with Western uh, with the Western image of Greece it's divided into two periods there's classical Greece, and then there are all these strange Mediterranean people we don't understand. And something happened in between. There was the, the ancient Greece that all the Germans and the French loved, and then there were these Christians. So, uh, you know, and, uh, and so there's not a natural connection in the mind of most Western peoples. I don't mean Americans, I mean most Western peoples, between ancient Greece, which they see as the universal inheritance of Europe and the West, and the development of Greek Christian culture and medieval and modern Byzantine culture. In fact, the view of Byzantium that still prevails even among my better educated friends is shockingly close to that of Edward Gibbon. So I don't know if that's relevant to the question you're actually asking, but I just think that the, the association isn't there in the mind of the culture. Um, you spoke about this, um, you know, this convert's ability to adopt the the Greek narrative, the Greek Orthodox narrative of Constantinople, right? Um, of course, he's still wearing a white belt. I mean, you have to work yeah, have to work on the on no, the, the, the way, Greek way. sense of style. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say you know okay. you need to get a Greek tailor, but you yeah, know, okay. But do you think, um, in in a sense, um, by adopting some of the ethnocultural traditions of of the churches that have been imported, these converts could root themselves in history better and actually contribute to America's burgeoning multiculturalism. Because sometimes I find from some evangelical, right, this Americanism that is averse to other languages and other cultures. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and in a sort of ahistorical form exactly. of orthodoxy, the, the faith yeah. statement at the back of the church, the set of propositions. Exactly. So some yeah. benefit of the ethno-culturality that we find in the I, I want them to appreciate the cultural and historical depths of orthodoxy, and I want them to see it in its full range of cultural realities, you know, Greek and Slavic and, and Arab and North African and and love and learn from all of that. I don't want them to create a fantasy history and then integrate themselves into it and, and begin resenting the Crusaders for destroying their ancient homeland. You know, it, 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 because then they're not really learning from the tradition, they're, they're, they're entering a fantasy novel, you know, and 
Uh, but I think, I mean, your point is well taken. You do want, you don't want us, I, when I talk about unified jurisdictions, I don't want them, I don't want them denatured. I don't want orthodoxy to somehow to become unaware of its cultural uh, past. Um, and, and it's nice in this country when you're in a parish that's really diverse in that sense. The Greek parish I go to uh, is, is really Greek, Antiochian, Russian, Eritrean, uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, families that have been displaced. It, it, it embraces the full world of Eastern Christianity, and, and it's lovely to see, but no one's forgetting where he or she came from. And so the converts who enter into that community uh, are also immersed in all those different traditions as well. So I, I'm not, I wouldn't advocate that. It would be nice if we could think of an institutional way of making the church a church, one church in the, as it should be in this land, uh, and, and recognizing that, that you don't have to become a Greek to become Orthodox. But at the same time, you know, appreciating that Orthodoxy is a, you know, deeply rooted in Greek history and culture. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to war and our economic system, uh, the Christian understanding of those things is completely at odds with the United States. Yeah, well, I say that sort of thing all the time. I appreciate so, your so. article and first things and common wheel about that. And, I mean, but is there something within, inherent within the tradition of orthodoxy where they have been able to, if anything, coexist in a different way? than the Western Church has been able to well, you know, in, in that sense, you might ask, um, rather than the model of how orthodoxy related to orthodox kings and emperors, you might ask how it related to um, um, Muslim rulers or, or communist rulers or others who were uh, either hostile to or difficult for the church. Because you're talking about an act of uh, hostility. Now, I don't know if, if that's exactly what we see developing, but yeah, in some quarters we do. It is sobering to see two senators basically putting a, a distinguished law professor through a faith test to see if she's qualified for the federal courts. A gross violation of constitutional order and done absolutely without shame or second thought. So yeah, I mean, I grant that. Uh, I think orthodoxy is, and, and this is true also of Coptic, uh, of the Coptic Church and all the Eastern churches that have had to live under impossible, seemingly impossible conditions, uh, centuries upon end, have shown ways of, of resisting by being faithful. But in this country, the difficulty is knowing where the differences lie, because as you know, America is just as liable, and this is, might be worse than active hostility, it's just as liable to conscript our pieties into its national adventures so that love of the nation becomes indistinguishable from good Christian decency. Uh, we see that all the time. Um, the Orthodox address that, or do you feel like I don't think, that, no, I don't think it's been adequately Orthodox. I, I, think, I think it's something we're just beginning to talk about. Uh, and not, not necessarily adequately. I mean, the Orthodox experience as I started as an immigrant experience here. And part of that is keeping your communities alive. Now it's becoming a, a, a convert community too, and that's raising all sorts of questions for the first time, perhaps. And that's sort of what I'm talking about tonight. Yeah. Oh, there's this hands up. Recently, blessed the opportunity to go and travel uh, the U.S. and I tried to stop at uh, uh, as many Greek churches along the way. As but did you go to the Johnny Cash Museum? Then you didn't travel the U.S. So. <laughs> but, um, baseball, baseball parks. Did you stop at the stadiums? Well, yeah, we, we saw okay, no, you're all right then. So, uh, so, uh, go on. We, um, you know, we went and tried to engage as many of these communities as possible. And we saw kind of a diversity of not just you know people at these communities, but the communities themselves how they're composed. And I saw a lot of what you were speaking about how 
you know, you had uh, families that were Serbian and, and Eritrean and, and, uh, and you know, Slovakian. And so I was wondering, you know, kind of going off of what you were speaking about before, if you could delve a little bit more into, you know, the role of these conglomerate communities. That the well, you know, it's funny, in a sense, you're, you're lucky if you're in a place where the, there's not enough of an Orthodox community for more than one church. Right. Yeah. I mean, be here in New York, you can just be Serbian all your life, Greek all your life, and never, you know, Russian Orthodox all your life, and never really spend much time with the other. Uh, in South Bend, there's a Greek church and a Serbian church. That's already too many, perhaps. <laughs> um, but I mean, they're both lovely churches, and there's at least one lovely priest. Um, <laughs> all right, I take that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think those communities, in a sense, reflect what the idealized American Orthodox parish would look like, in which you're not dissolving cultural memory, but you institutionally unified place where native Eastern Christians and converts uh, create a diverse community, the way the, the country's a diverse community, yeah. So I think those small churches, those local parishes that, you know, I, 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 the Greek church in Charlottesville where I used to go also was, um, <laughs> I mean, there was a there was a mission church of that that California group of Seraphim Roses. What what are they called? Um, right, but they were very small, sort of like Saint Saint Pantaleon. The Greek church is where you went. So there were Greeks, there were Russians, there were again Ethiopian Christians, and then later a Ukrainian mission church did open in the area. But the same was true there, and uh, you know it, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, and and uh, I I been Orthodox thirty years, and I can walk though into a truly ethno nationalist sort of church in certain big cities, and know that I'm a stranger there whose presence is just inconceivable. You know, look at me, and oh, he's got blue eyes. <laughs> Why is he here? <laughs> and so I, I think you're right. I mean, those I, I think uh, the small local parishes that have to accommodate 100 Antiochians, 100 Greeks, 40 Russians. They're, they're, they're almost uh, an ideal model for what might emerge. Thank you. Oh, one more. I was going to take one more. Yeah. Just because I like his hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> I destroyed them, yes. utterly. <laughs> they just disappeared from the scene. Uh, um, you know, I mean, first of, all, first of all, I'm not the one who chose the name of that book, Atheist Delusions. I just called it the Christian Revolution. Blame my editors. They didn't know that I would sell. Now they, they, they say they let me keep my own titles. But so. um, I, I would say that was a publishing fad. I think the, the real atheism, I think what's more the case now is there's just a general kind of drifting away. The kind of militant, you know, boring bulldog British atheism of Richard Dawkins or the kind of confused American variant of Steven Pinker. It's, well it is, I mean it's just silly. I mean it's, it's just not interesting. It's not, I mean atheism used to be interesting. In the 18th and 19th centuries, you had titanic atheist figures who were challenging Christians to think their faith. These guys don't challenge you to, you know, wake up entirely before talking to them. I mean, it's, just not, it's not an intellectually interesting conversation, and I think it was a publishing fad. What I think the, 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 the is more the case now that people have to think about is more just the kind of casual. Because, you know, I lived many years in Britain, and my wife's English, and, like, and, and what's, what's kind of shocking to the system for an American in, say, 1984, sorry, when I was in Britain in university, was not the people who were adamantly, ferociously anti-Christian, it's the ones to whom it just didn't even, never thought of asking the question in all 50 years of life. I mean, you know, that sort of malaise that you, that's very much a part of European Western European culture is more and more the, going to be the case here. It's making people think the question is even to be asked. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much.
so as we heard, um, Father McShane, the president of the university, is having emergency root canal surgery, um, and in, in his place, um, but hardly a step down, is um, Dr. Stephen Friedman, the provost of the university, and yet another great friend of the center. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Friedman to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of Father McShane, uh, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, but also on behalf of uh, many of my cal uh, colleagues, uh, Father Mick McCarthy, uh, Roger Malice, our Vice President for Development, uh, Dr. Ellen Page Smith, our Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs. I know I speak for them uh, when I say uh, nights like tonight make us really proud of working and being a part of Fordham University. We are a part of an outstanding Jesuit Catholic University here in New York City, and uh, we're celebrating our 176th year. And I kept reflecting that uh, events like tonight, on such a beautiful evening in late September, could not take place at institutions like Fordham 176 years ago. Why we're so proud is that we have events like tonight to celebrate your rich heritage and our rich heritage. And our heritages are richer because of events like tonight. Since 2004, the Orthodoxy in American Lecture has been the centerpiece and signature event of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. But I like to think of it as a signature and centerpiece event of the best of Fordham University. Uh, His Eminence Richard, uh, uh, Archbishop Demetrius, every time I see His Eminence, I realize that there is warmth in differences and warmth in similarities and warmth in being part of something larger than ourselves. And Archbishop, you make us proud uh, of your presence. I know Father McShane uh, uh, speaks of you in the highest terms, and, and thank you very much for being a part of our community. Uh, our speaker, uh, David Bentley Hart, uh, when you spoke about conversions and you spoke of differences, what I understood is that divisions are not meant to be deepened, uh, but to understood, and to be understood in a way uh, that brings out uh, a clarity of vision and spirituality, the spiritual ethos that you bring forward, uh, really uh, uh, spoke uh, to all of us in a way that was very, very substantial and important. George and Telly, um, the center at Fordham is our pride. We have two outstanding theology faculty persons in George and Telly, and I want to acknowledge their tremendous contribution to the scholarship of the university, but to all that they do uh, for our students, our faculty and staff and administrators. George and Telly, thank you for your leadership. As George mentioned, I have felt a tremendous part of the Greek Orthodox family here at Fordham. Uh, and it means so much to me to have been embraced by the Pappases and the Pattersons and so many others. Uh, embrace me in ways that I didn't think uh, was uh, possible. But it's a privilege to know uh, and being a part of, of the rich community and feel a part of the uh, Pappas and Patterson and broader community here in, in New York City. Uh, tonight is even more special for me. Uh, Father Jerry Blaschek is here. Uh, I know that Jerry played a really significant role in the initiation of this center. When I first moved from uh, Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, uh, to Fordham University. Uh, I have a good friend in, in, uh, in uh, Spokane, uh, Father Pat Lee, who called Jerry up. And uh, Jerry was one of the first who invited me to spend time with him, helping me understand and uh, be a part of a Fordham community that I needed to understand in, in its depth. 
And uh, Jerry, uh, when I met with him here in the New York City area, uh, was, was a great friend. I also remember when I had the great privilege of spending time with the Patriarch uh, Bartholomew in Istanbul. It was Jerry. Uh, it was in Istanbul at that time. And Jerry gave me the courage uh, to spend the night uh, with the Patriarch. And in my home is a, is a signed book that I received on my birthday from uh, the Patriarch. Uh, I'm very proud of that because he provides me with the importance of ecumenism uh, and the importance of understand each other in deep and meaningful ways and his commitment to environmental st stability and all that means for our world is a sign that we together, uh, if we uh, understand our differences but respect each other's differences, the world will be a much better place. So tonight reminded us how we are so fortunate to be at an institution like Fordham where events like this can have such meaning. So thank you. Archbishop, would you like to conclude our, our evening with your benediction? Some of you may know that the inaugural Orthodoxy in America lecture was offered by His Eminence Archbishop Demetrius of the Greek Orthodox Church of America, and he will, has now kindly agreed to offer our benediction this evening. Your Eminence. May I, I ask you to sit down? Benediction is one thing I would like to offer, but I think I should have some minutes uh, that are a little bit beyond the very few sentences of a benediction, which normally is not a long prayer, it's just a blessing. And I would like to have this time uh, to thank, first, the speaker tonight, plenty of substantive theology, history, philosophy, good sense of humor. <laughs> we are for humor, we Orthodox. We are deadly against sarcasm. <laughs> humor is already dead. You used a word an adjective, elliptical. It's a Greek word. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very smart word because it designates some condition of missing, ellipsis, but at the same time, elliptical is indication of a geometrical shape 